We'll take another question, please. John Flaherty. Was the Scottish Government sensible to release the Lockerbie bomber? Majid Nawaz, was the Scottish Government sensible, sensible to release the Lockerbie bomber? I think it was a nonsensical move, and I'm, I'm yet to understand why they did it. Um, I, uh, they thought he was dying of cancer. Yes, but apparently... And he only, is, isn't he? One of the, no, well, apparently only one of the doctors out of the around 20 who were asked gave that assessment, and his assessment was the one that was picked. Oh. So I'm astonished that he was released. I'm uh, astonished that he's received as a hero in Libya. Um, again, uh, uh, coming back to the point of offence, uh, the, the real issue is not that it offends us that they're celebrating uh, the anniversary of his release. I think the real issue is why he was released in the first place. And, and with the uh, news of BP's lobbying behind the scenes for oil exploitation in Libya, and the fact that the Libyan government is opening up trade to the world, and the fact that the British government is heavily involved in seeking investments in Libya, it all smacks too much of the old politics of econo economic interests putting, being made priority over everything else. And I think it's a very worrying development, and, and I hope the precedent isn't set for that so in you other cases. So you don't believe the Scottish Government when it says this was done entirely on compassionate grounds within the rules governing the, the Scottish prison system? Yeah, it's a bit like saying we're invading Iraq because we genuinely believe there's weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> Alex von Tunzelman. Yeah, it's an unfortunate story, isn't it? Because it just keeps looking worse and worse. I mean, I was inclined to believe the Scottish Government originally, and I, I must say, the more that comes out, the more doubt I have about this case. I think it's, um, it's certainly now looking like a pretty dodgy decision. And I think if, I mean, I... I Can you explain why it's, it's now looking dodgy and then perhaps it wasn't before? Well, just because more and more information comes out that looks like, as Majid said, that, you know, maybe the, actually the medical opinion wasn't quite as conclusive as it seemed to be and so forth. Um, I do think that, from what I've read, it looks like his conviction might have been pretty unsafe. But if that was the case, if some people have been saying today that perhaps this was done as a kind of fix to get the Scottish Government out of having to go through a retrial, I actually think procedure needs to be followed and you needed to go through a retrial. All right. Uh, Ruth Deitch, was it... Was the Scottish Government sensible to release the Lockerbie bomber? No, it wasn't sensible and it was wrong. First of all, because of the health issue and he wasn't properly checked up. Though I note that Ronnie Biggs is still alive, is he not? And we've been told, I don't know how many times, that he is at death's door and he, he was let out. But they it's clearly human, didn't it's check It's continuing the human life not something to celebrate. Um, I'm very glad that, that people live, but it, if you start letting out a prisoner, everyone who has a dodgy um, medical history, well, we'd save money, wouldn't we? But I'm not sure it's a, it, it's a very good reason. Secondly, there may be doubts about his innocence, but Al McGrath himself or his advisers dropped the appeal. If he was so sure that he was innocent, he should have allowed that appeal to go ahead, and then he could have walked out as a free man with his head held high. And from what I've read, there was a fair chance that he would have won that appeal. And the fact that he didn't pursue it seems to me very odd. But the final reason is I'm fed up with this Scottish waving of nationalism when it suits them. All right, they're devolved. But I think they did this just to show the rest of us, oh, that we are independent, we make our own decisions. And it's been very embarrassing to the rest of us. And it started me thinking along these lines. If Scotland wants to be independent, Okay, be my guest, go ahead. Do what you want and... <laughs> Please take back with you all the Scottish politicians. There are so many of them, <laughs> you know, starting with Blair and Brown and Campbell. Take them all back and off you go and go off on your own because actually we're all subsidising, I think, uh, by way of benefits and all sorts of reasons. And if they want to show how independent they are, okay, thank you. And goodbye. I, I want to know. Uh, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm rather keen to know uh, where Ruth thinks the half Scottish panellists on any questions should go. Uh, I'm slightly worried about my position now. Um, uh, my mother's uh, the, Scottish, by oh, the way. So thank, it's thank goodness for that. Uh, the, um, we'll meet in the borderland somewhere. Um, <laughs> the, the, the thing is, is, I absolutely agree with that. First of all, uh, McGrath should have died in prison, no doubt about it. Uh, and uh, the. 
uh, advice uh, uh, of the, the, the alleged doctors is, is, is galling here because uh, Kenny McCaskill, the, the so-called uh, Scottish Justice Secretary, is not very much to do if you're the Scottish Justice Secretary in a devolved uh, Scottish uh, Assembly. Uh, you can at least read the one important bit of news that's come across your desk in the last five years. Um, the problem uh, that I think the most galling thing about this whole thing is this pretend horrible charade building in Edinburgh called the Scottish Parliament and the horrible charade politicians who inhabit it and who occasionally crawl out of the uh, darkness and explain something to the, to the rest of us um, as if, uh, as if uh, we've, we, we've never thought of moral questions before. I mean, Kenny McCaskill and Alex Salmon, these horrible grandstanding uh, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse politicians, have been parading around talking about the unique compassion of the Scottish people. We, we are uniquely compassionate. No one else feels compassion like me. I'm feeling so compassionate at the moment I can hardly bear it. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm half compassionate. Maybe I am half, um, half it's missing on the English side. I think this is appalling, and the most appalling way to, the po to do politics. And uh, I, I think this is, you know, no good can come from this I institution, the Scottish uh, uh, Parliament. And w whilst it's there, and the union continues to fragment while many nationalists like Salmon and McCaskill are around, whilst this continues, I say no good will come from it. And this, this country will continue to be faced with these ridiculous figures making ridiculous pronouncements which embarrass us all. Majid, briefly. Just, <laughs> just to say for our Scottish listeners, I mean, you know, just to say that we do love you all and, you know, when, <laughs> I love the Highlands. They're and, not listening yes, anymore. Right. <laughs> so, they just turned off. No, and I just wanted to add something. I think that, I think there does need to be a full inquiry into this and I think that uh, there needs to be inquiry into this into program. The, into, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> into the anti-Scottish rhetoric on this, right. but no, no, but, but in the decision uh, made by the Scottish Government, but also the involvement of, uh, generally, of the UK in this, not just the Scots, but everyone else as well. All right, let's take our next question, if we may, and uh, it may well be the last one of the programme. Let's hear it. Ron Curley, would the members of the panel embark on a university course today, knowing that they could be £25,000 in debt by the end of it? Well... Doug Douglas. <laughs> oh, yeah, very good uh, heckle from the floor, I should repeat. I uh, claim it as mine. No, somebody just said uh, only in England. It's a very good point as well, because, of course, we subsidise uh, people north of the border in this as in so many other ways. Um, uh, the fact is, no, I, I think that most people would, would definitely think twice. I was very lucky. I, was, I went to university in the last year where you didn't have to pay uh, tuition fees. Um, somebody has to pay, though when you go to university. Certainly if you have the uh, attainment targets that are currently being set of the number of people that the government wants to be in university, it, it, it is going to have to be paid for. And, uh, Ruth Deitch knows this much better than me, but you know, there are serious funding problems. Uh, whilst it is paid for by the individual student, uh, it, it is definitely very off-putting. I, I have, uh, like uh, Majid, uh, my, my friend Majid on the panel here, um, <laughs> uh, my old buddy, uh, the, uh, uh, like him, I, I run a, a a small think tank here in London, and it, it is very worrying. I have to tell you, small when you see when you see, um, uh, when you see uh, people coming out of university and applying for jobs and hugely in debt, and knowing it's going to be very, very hard to pay that off, it's right. a very troubling sight. Majid, well, I, th um, I, I think I'd rather be. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened when I went to university. I was imprisoned in Egypt when I went to pursue my studies, so I'd rather be twenty-five thousand pounds in debt. But seriously, um, I think there's a real concern here. I, I will come out in support of the. Uh, the, the change in the way in which flat rate fees are charged currently for students. I think the policy of a progressive fee system for students is much more uh, common sense. I mean, I think that currently, if we give an analogy to the poll tax, currently we're charging students in something akin to the poll tax, a flat rate fee for their degrees, regardless of how much they end up earning. So someone who's going to be ending up earning because he studies economics in the London School of Economics uh, and he gets to, to a city bank and he's earning more than £100,000 a year, will pay the same amount for his course as someone who studies nail technology in you know, an unnamed university. So I, I, I would say that, yes, we need to seriously reform this system. Alex von Tenzelman. Yeah, I mean, I think he, uh, Majid is right, actually. That, I mean, university degrees, they do, if you look generally at earning across a lifetime, but actually it breaks down very differently depending on which subject you take, uh, status of the university you go to, and your own socioeconomic background. So it certainly doesn't guarantee you necessarily these higher earnings. Um, I think we might well end up moving towards a different pattern of university going. I think a lot pe more people might start going as mature students, going straight into the workforce and then going in later. Ruth Deitch, I'll give you £25,000 if you can summarise your views on this subject in about 30-odd seconds. 
I'll make, well, the answer is a million times yes. And let me confess something on air, very important. I hold this world record, I think. It took me nine attempts before I got into Oxford. That's including Cambridge, nine. And I had a failed A-level behind me. And I knew that I had to go. It was the only way out of what I was into something else. And it's not about earning money. I've been so upset to hear this week it's all about earning 100,000 over your lifetime. Not a bit of it. It's about changing your life. It's about intelligence and intelligibility and becoming a citizen and transmitting knowledge and becoming ambitious and a stakeholder in society and changing your life. And it's worth everything. I'm afraid you went slightly over, so the money isn't yours. But, <laughs> but I do want to thank you, uh, Baroness Deitch, uh, also Alex von Tanzelman, Douglas Murray, and Majid Nawaz, who are going outside, no doubt, for a discussion. Uh, to you here in Sutton Coldfield and to you at home, thanks for listening.